Uh, welcome. Ah, okay. Now this was the reply Odysseus made. Alcinous, king and admiration of men, how beautiful this is to hear a minstrel gifted as yours, a god he might be, singing. There's no boom in life more sweet, I say, than when a summer joy holds all the realm, and banqueters sit listening to a harper in a great hall by rows of tables heaped with bread and roast meat, while a steward goes to dip up wine and brim your cups again. Here is the flower of life, it seems to me, but now you wish to know my cause for sorrow and thereby give me cause for more. What shall I say first? Well, what shall I keep until the end? The gods have tried me in a thousand ways, but first my name, let that be known to you, and if I pull away from pit pitiless death, friendship will bind us, though my land lies far. I'm Laertes' son, Odysseus. Men hold me formidable for guile and peace and war. This fame has gone abroad to the sky's rim. My home is on the peaked sea mark of Ithaca, under Mount Neon's winds, wind-blown robe of leaves. In sight of other islands, Dolikion, Sami, wooded Zekinthos, Ithaca being most lofty in that coastal sea, and northwest, while the rest lie east and south. A rocky isle, but good for a boy's training. I shall not see on earth a place more dear, though I have been detained long by Calypso, loveliest among the goddesses who, who hold me in her smooth caves to be her heart's delights as perk of Aya, 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 Oof. Yeah, pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, you good. Hey, Ia. Hey, Ia. Hey, Ia. <clears throat> Kirk of Aia, the enchantress, desired me and detained me in our hall. But in my heart, I never gave consent. Where shall a mind find sweetness to surpass his own home and his parents? In far lands he shall not, though he find a house of gold. What of my sailing, then, from Troy? What of those years of rough adventure, weathered under Zeus, the wind that carried west from Ilion, that brought me to Ismaros, Ismaros on the far shore, a stronghold on the coast of the Kikones. A sto I stormed that place and killed the men who fought. Plunder we took, and we enslaved the women to make division, equal shares to all. But on the spot I told them, back, and quickly, out to sea again. My men were mutinous, fools on stores of wine. Sheep after sheep, they butchered by the surf, and shambling cattle, feasting, while fugitives went inland, running to call to arms the main force of the Kaikones. This was an army, trained to fight on horseback, or where the ground required on foot. They came with dawn over that terrain like the leaves and blades of spring. So doom appeared to us, dark word of Zeus for us, our evil days. My men stood up and made a fight for it, backed on the ships. With the lances kept in play. From bright morning through the blaze of noon, holding our breach, although so far outnumbered. But when the sun passed toward unyoking time, when the Achaeans one by one gave way, six, be six benches were left empty in every ship that evening when we pulled away from death. And this new grief we bore with us to see. Our precious lives we had, but not all, but not our friends. No ship made sail next day until some shipmate had raised a cry three times for each poor ghost unfleshed by Kaikonas on that field. Basically, Odysseus is telling the story of the Trojan War, and he's like, okay, and he's telling his story to the people who asked about. So the people were like, hey, what's your name? What are you doing here? And then Odysseus is like, ah, let me tell you the entire thing that the audience already knows. And let me recap it for everyone. And so now he's he's just going through the same thing again. Except um, this time he's adding in more details. And he's saying like, ah, so I was blown to this island and I was kept 
kept uh, on the island for a really long time. And so then I, uh, now let me tell you about my sailing from Troy. Those years, uh, sorry about me doing this with my jacket. It's, it's un, um, it's unavoidable. Uh, basically what he says is that, is that his men, they were all lined up in this one place and they were, you know, they like won a battle. And then he basically said, we, we got all this stuff. Now let's go back out to sea. But all my men were like drunk and they were like all shambles. And so these people, they came in on horseback and they killed like a bunch of my men and we fought them off as best as we could. But like a lot of people died and now we're, we're really sad about it. Now Zeus, the lord of the cloud, roused in the north, a storm against the ships, and driving veils of squall moved down like night on land and sea. The bows went up plugging at the gusts, sails cracked and lashed out strips in the big wind. We saw death in that fury, dropped the yards, unshipped the oars, and pulled for the nearest lee. Then two long days and nights we lay offshore, worn out and sick at heart, tasting our grief. Until a third dawn came with ringlets shining. Then we put up our masts, hauled the sail, and rested, letting the steersmen and the breeze take over. I might have made it home safely that time, but as I came round Malaya, the current took me out to sea, and from the north, a fresh gale drove me past Kythera. Nine days I drifted on the teeming sea before dangerous high winds. Upon the tenth, we came to the coastline of the Lotus Eaters, who live upon that flower. We landed there to take on water. All ships' companies mustered alongside for the midday meal. Then I sent out two picked men and a runner to learn what race of men that land sustained. They fell in, soon enough, with Lotus Eaters, who showed no will to do us harm, only offering us the sweet Lotus to our friends. But those who are at this honeyed planet, the Lotos, never care to report, nor return. They long to stay forever, rousing on that native bloom, forgetful of their homeland. I drove them, all three, wailing to the ships, tied them down under their rowing benches, and called the rest. All hands aboard, come, clear the bench, and no one tastes the Lotos, or you lose your hope of home. Filing into their places by the rowlocks, my oarsmen dipped their long oars in the surf, and we moved out again on our seafaring. Basically, what just happened is Odysseus said, okay, we were taking our ship out, but we got drifted. We got drifted, like, far out. And we got to these guys. They're called the Lod ah, that's annoying. They're called the Lotos Eaters. And Lotos Eaters, they give you Lotos, and Lotos, apparently, makes you want to stay on that island forever. And it makes you never want to go home. And so they were like, ah, no, we're not eating your lotus. And so they didn't eat the lotus. And that's 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 that. All right. Um in the next day, in the next land, we found were cyclopses, giants, louts, with the law to bless them. In ignorance, leaving the fruitage of the earth in mystery to the immortal gods, they neither plow nor sow by hand, nor till the ground through grain, wild wheat and barley, grows untended, and wine grapes and clusters ripe in, in the heaven's rain. Cyclopses have no muster and no meeting, no consultation or, or tr old tribal ways, but each one dwells in his own mountain cave, dealing out rough justice to wife and child, indifferent to what the others do. Well then, across the wide bay from the mainland, there lies a desert island, not far out, but still not close in shore. Wild goats and hundreds breed there, and no human become a uh, being comes upon the isle to startle them. No hunter of all who ever tracked with hounds through forests or had rough going over the mountain trails. The isle, unplanted and untilted, a wilderness, pastures, goats alone. And this is why good ships like ours with cheek paint at the bows are far beyond the cyclopses. No shipwright toils them among them, shaping and building up symmetrical trim hulls to cross the sea and visit all the seaboard towns, as men do, who go on 
who go and come in commerce over water. This isle, seagoing folk have annexed it and built their homesteads on it. All good land, fertile for every crop and season. Lush, well-watered meads along the shore, vines in profusion. Prairie, clear for the plow, where grain would grow chin high by harvest time. And rich subsoil, the island co cove is landlocked. So you need no hat hat Ha hossers. Hoss hosser. Thick rope. Hosser. Okay. Hosser. So No hosers out astern. Bow stones are mooring. Chafe to be under sail, and a fair wind blows. You'll find good water flowing from a cavern, through dusky poplars into the upper bay. Here we made harbor. Some god guided us that night, for we could barely see our bows in the dense fog around us. And no moonlight filtered through the overcasts. No lookout. Nobody saw the island dead ahead, nor even the great land landward rolling billow that took us in. We found ourselves in shallows, keels grazing shore. So furled our sails and disembarked where the low ripples broke. There on the beach we lay and slept till morning. Basically what happened, they went to a land. So they sailed off from wherever they were in the, the lotus eaters. And then they go to the Cyclops land where they had it with giants. And they're like, ah, all right. And then they, they went to the mainland where it wasn't a desert island, and there was, like, wild goats, and there was a city, and they were, like, they, they made it residential. And so then they just, you know. And so the cove is landlocked, so they, it's just describing the island. It's just giving you some imagery, and then they laid on the beach until, and they slept there until morning, and then they continued on their Journey, when Dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, we turned out marveling to tour the isle, while Zeus's shy nymph daughter flushed wild goats down from the heights. A breakfast for my men. We ran to fetch our hunting bows and long shanked lances from the ships. And in three companies, we took our shots. Heaven gave us a game plenty. For every one of twelve ships in my squadron, nine goats fell to be shared. My lot was ten, so there all day, until the sun went out, we made a feast on meat galore and wine. Wine from the ship, for supply held out. So many jars were filled at Ismaris, from stores of Kaikonas that we plundered. We gazed, too, at Cyclops' land, or Kyclops, Kyclopes' land. So near, we saw their smoke, heart, head hard bleeding from their flocks. But after sundown and the gathering dusk, we slept again above the water ripples. Sorry, it was not residential. It was not a residential area at all. It was very wilderness. I'm sorry I said that. They just found a bunch of wild goat and they killed the wild goat. And they also see cyclopses off in the, off in the distance, but they sleep on the island once again. When the dawn, when the young dawn with her finger, with fingertips of rose came in the east. <laughs> I hate that. I hate how he always say that. With the young dawn with fingertips of rose came in the east, I called my men gather and made a speech to them. Old shipmates, friends, the rest of you should stand by. I'll make the crossing in my own ship with my own company and find out what the mainland natives are, for they may be wild savages, lawless, or hospitable and God-fearing men. At this I went aboard, and gave the word to cast off by the stern. My oarsmen followed, filing in to their benches by the rowlocks, and all in line dipped oars in the gray sea. As we rowed on, nearer to the mainland, at one end of the bay we saw a cavern yawning above the water, screened with laurel, and many rams and goats about the place, inside a sheepfold made from slabs of stone, earth fast between tall trunks of pine and rugged towering oak trees. 
A prodigious man slept in his, this cave alone and took his flocks to graze a field, remote from all companions, knowing none but savage ways, a brute so huge he seemed no man at all of these who eat good wheat and bread, but he seemed rather a shaggy mountain reared in solitude. We beached there, and I told the crew to stand by and keep watch over the ship. As for myself, I took my twelve best fighters and went ahead. I had a goat skin full of that sweet liquor that Euanthes, you, you, oh my God, Euanthes' son, Maron, had given to me. He kept Apollo's holy goat grove at Imoros for kindness. We showed him there and showed his wife and child. He gave me seven shining gold talents, perfectly formed, a, a solid silver wine bowl, and then his liquor. Twelve two-handled jars of brandy, pure and fiery. Not a slave in Maron's household knew this drink. Only he, his wife, and the storeroom mistress knew. And they would put one cupful, ruby-colored, honey-smooth, and twenty more of water. But still the sweet scent hovered like a fume over the wine bowl. No man turned away when cups of this came around. So basically, they travel into the mainland, and they're like, ah, we got to figure out who inhabits this island. I know we saw cyclopses and goats, but I mean, like, that's not really people. And so they go looking for some people, and then they, f they took out some people to s sketch it out. And he had goat skin that was full of really good wine, really good liquor, and it was like really... Really good, and no one wanted to turn that liquor down. And so he has this wine, this goat skin, or wine skin, wine skin. So he has this big bat goat skin full of, of liquor, and he's taking a wine skin full I brought along, and victuals in a bag. For in my bones I knew some towering brute would be upon us soon. All outward power, a wild man, ignorant of civility. We climbed then briskly to the cave, but Cyclops had gone f afield to pasture his fat sheep. So we looked around at everything inside, a drying rack that sa sagged with cheeses, pens crowded with lambs and kids, each in its class, firstling apart from the middlings, and the dewdrops, or newborn lambkins, penned from apart from both, and vessels full of whey were brimming there, Bowls of earthenware and pails for milking. My men came pressing around me, pleading. Sorry, I have to make sure that I'm not. What are cyclop? Uh, cyclops. Yeah. Okay. So cyclopes. Whenever you see those, that just means cyclops. Uh, why not take these cheeses, get them stowed, come back, throw open all the pens, and make a run for it? We'll drive the kids and lambs aboard. We say put out again on good salt water. And so basically, they go into this guy's house, who's like the leader, and they're like, ah, why don't we raid it, take all of his stuff, and then make a run for it? But Odysseus says, ah, how sound that was. Yet I refused. I wished to see the caveman, what he had to offer. No pretty sight, it turned out, for my friends. We lit a fire, burnt an offering, and took out some cheese to eat, then sat in silent around the embers, waiting. When he came, he had a loud of dry bows on his sh shoulder to stoke his fire at supper time. He dumped it with great crash into that hollow cave, and we all scattered fast to the far wall. Then over the broad cavern floor, he ushered the ewes he meant to milk. He left his rams and he goats in the yard outside and swung high overhead a slab of solid rock too close to, to close the cave. Two dozen four-wheeled wagons with having heaving wagon teams could not have stirred the tonnage of that rock from where he wedged it over the door sill. Next, he took his seat and milked his bleeding ewes. Those are baby goats. If I'm not... I don't know how to pronounce it. Female sheep. Sorry, not baby. You. It's just a you. Not you. <laughs> you. Um, 
A practice job he made of it, giving each ewe her suckling, thickened his milk then into curds and whey, sieved out the curds to drip in with the baskets, and poured the whey to stand in bowls, cooling until he drank it for his supper. When all these chores were done, he poked the fire, heaping on brushwood. In the glare, he saw us. So basically, the Cyclops, he comes in, and he's like, Ugh! Let me milk my let me milk my sheep, get my milk, let me close off my cave with this giant boulder. And everyone's scared, even though they were waiting for him to see what he had to offer. And so, you know, he's a giant man. He's a giant man. And he didn't see them initially, but then he did see them. Strangers, he said, who are you and where are from? What brings you here by seaways? A fair traffic or are you wandering rogues who cast your lives like dice and ravage other folk by sea? We felt a pressure on our hearts in dread of that deep rumble in that mighty man. But all the same, I spoke up in reply. We are from Troy, Achaeans, blown off course by shifting gales on the great South Sea, homeward bound, but taking roots in ways uncommon. So the will of Zeus would have it. We served under Agamemnon, son of Atreus. The whole world knows what city he laid waste, what armies he destroyed. It was our luck to come here. Here we stand, beholden for your help, or any gifts you give, as custom is to honor strangers. We would entreat you, great sir. Have a care... Have a care for the gods' courtesy. Zeus will avenge the unoffending guest. All right. Basically, Odysseus is like, ah, we were we were blown here accidentally. Ah, but you better be nice, because Zeus doesn't like people who aren't nice to strangers. We have quite a bit longer to go. Ten pages. He answered this from his brute chest, unmoved. You are a ninny, or else you come from the other end of nowhere. Telling me, mind the gods. We Cyclopses are not a whistle for your thundering Zeus, or all the gods in bliss. We have more force by far. I would not let you go for fear of Zeus. You or your friends, unless I have to whim to. Tell me, where was it now? You left your ship, around the point or down the shore, I wonder. He thought he'd find out, but I saw through this and answered with a ready lie. My ship, Poseidon Lord, who sets the earth a tremble, broke it up on the rocks at your land's end. A wind from seaward served him, drove us there. We are survivors, these good men and I. Neither reply nor pity came from him, but in one stride he clutched my at my companions and caught two in his hands like squirming puppies to beat their brains out, spattering the floor. Then he dismembered them and made his meal gaping and crunching like a mountain lion. Everything, innards, flesh, and marrow, and bones. We cried aloud, lifting our hands to Zeus, powerless, looking at on at this, appalled. But Cyclops went on filling up his belly with man flesh and great gulps of whey, then lay down like a mast among his sheep. My heart beat high now at the chance of action, and drawing the sharp sword from my hip, I went along to his flank to stab him where the midriff holds the liver. I touched the spot when sudden fear stayed me. If I killed him, we perished there as well, for we can never move his ponderous doorway slab aside. So we were left to groan and wait for morning. Oh, all right. <laughs> so basically what happened is the Cyclops ate one of Odysseus's men after he told he lied to him about his ship being destroyed and then the guy he eats one of the people and so Odysseus is mad. So once the giant falls asleep or the Cyclops falls asleep, he goes to stab him in like a spot that would kill him. But then he's like, "Oh wait, who would move that giant boulder? We're going to have to wait until morning." When the young dawn, with her fingertips of rose, lit up the world, the Cyclops built a fire and milked his handsome ewes, all in due order, putting the sucklings to the mothers. Um, then, his chores being all dispatched, he caught another brace of men to make his breakfast and whisked away his great door slab to let his sheep go through. But he, behind, reset the stone as one would cap a quiver. There was a din of whistling as the Cyclops rounded his flock to higher ground, then stillness. And now I pondered how to hurt him worse. But if, if, if but Athena granted what I prayed for, here are the means that I thought 
would serve my turn. A club or staff lay there along the fold, an olive tree, felled green and left a season for Cyclops' hand. And it was like a mast, a lugger of twenty oars, broad in the beam, a deep sea-going craft, might carry so long, so big around, it seemed. Now I chopped out a six-foot section of this pole and set it down before my men, who scraped at it. And when they had it smooth, I hewed again to make a stake with a pointed end. I held this in the fire's heat and turned it, toughening it, then hit it. Well back in the cavern, under one of the dung power piles in profusion there. Now came the time to toss for it. Who ventured along with me? Whose hands could bear to thrust and grind that spike in the Cyclops' eye? When mild sleep had mastered him, as luck would have it, the men and I would have chosen one the toss. Four strong men, and I made five as captain. So basically, the giant goes out, he closes the rock, and he closes the pathway out of the cave again, and so he's like herding his sheep, but then the guys, they plan out, they take a giant log, and they make it into a big um, stake, and they're planning to poke his eye out. And so he and four other men uh, plan to poke his eye out. At evening came the shepherd with the homemade um with the homemade steak. At evening came the shepherd with his flock, his woolly flock. The rams as well, this time, entered the cave by some sheep herding whim, or God's bidding, none were left outside. He hefted his great boulder into place, and sat him down to milk the bleeding ewes in proper order, put the lambs to suck and swiftly ran through all his evening chores. My moment was at hand, and I went forward holding an ivy bowl of my dark drink, looking up, saying, Cyclops, try some wine. Here's liquor to wash down your scraps of men. Taste it, and see the kind of drink we carried under our planks. I meant it for an offering if you would help us home. But you are mad, unbearable, a bloody monster. After this, will you any other traveler come to see you? He seized and drained the bowl, and it went down so fiery and smooth he called for more. Give me another, thank you kindly. Tell me, how are you called? I'll make a gift will please you. Even Cyclopses know the wine grapes grow out of grassland and loam in heaven's rain. But here's a bit of nectar and ambrosia. Three bowls I brought him, and he poured them down. I saw the fuddle and flush come over him. Then I sang out in cordial tones, Cyclops... You ask my honorable name. Remember the gift you promised me, and I shall tell you. My name is Nobody. Mother, father, and friends. Everyone calls me Nobody. And he said, Nobody's my meat. Then, after I eat his friends, others come first. There's a noble gift now. Even as he spoke, he reeled and tumbled backward his great head lolling to one side, and sleep took him like any creature, drunk, hiccuping, and he dribbled steam, streams of liquor and bits of men. Now by the gods, I drove my big hand spike deep in the embers, charring it again, and cheered my men along with battle talk to keep their courage up. No quitting now. The pike of olive, green though it had been, reddened and glowed as if about to catch. I drew it from the coals in my Four fellows gave me a hand, lugging it near the Cyclops, as more than natural force nerved them. Straight forward they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it in deep into his crater eye, and leaned on it, turning it as a shipwright turns a drill and planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that spins it in the grove. So with their brand, we bored that great eye socket while blood ran around the red-hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared. The pierced ball hissed broiling. The roots popped. Oh, my God. So basically, they feed the Cyclops wine, and he's like, Ah, oh, thank you. I'll save you for last. I'll eat you last. And then they stab him in the eye, and they describe it in vivid detail. After he's drunk, they stab him in the eye. God, oh my God, whew. In a smithy, one sees a white-hot axe or an adze plunged and ring wrung in a cold tube, tub, screeching steam, the way they make soft iron hail and hard, just so that the eyeball hissed around the spike. The cyclops bellowed, and the rock roared around him, and we fell back in fear. Clawing his face, he tugged the bloody spike out of his eye, threw it away, and his wild hands went groping. 
Then he set up a howl for Cyclopses, who ne lived in caves on windy peaks nearby. Some heard him, and they came by divers ways to clump around the outside and call. What ails you, Polyphemus? Why do you cry so sore in the starry night? You will not let us sleep. Sure, no man's driving off your flock. No man has tricked you. Ruined you? Out of the cave, the mammoth Polyphemus roared in the answer. Nobody, nobody's tricked me. Nobody's ruined me. To this rough shout, they made a sage reply. Ah, uh, well, if nobody has played you foul there in your lonely bed, we are no use in pain, given by great Zeus. Let it be your father, Poseidon Lord, to whom you pray. <laughs> it's so stupid. So Odysseus, the absolute con man, said his name was Nobody. And the, the Polyphemus was so dull as to not realize that Nobody... Sounds like nobody. And so the giants outside thought that nobody had hurt the giant. And so they thought nothing was wrong. It, it's a pun. And so I'm pretty sure they had to, like, change the way they pronounced it under the Greek translation. Nobody, nobody's tricked me. Okay. So saying, they trailed away. And I was filled with laughter to see how, like a charm, the name deceived them. Now Cyclops, wheezing as the pain came on him, fumbled to wrench away the great doorstone and squatted in the breach with arms thrown wide for any silly beast or man who bolted, hoping somehow I might be such a fool. But I kept thinking how to win the game. Death sat there, huge. How could we slip away? I drew on all my wits and ran through tactics, reasoning on a man, will for dear life, until a trick came, and it pleased me well. So the Cyclops' rams were handsome, fat, with heavy fleeces, or dark velvet. I tied them silently together, twining cords of willow from the ogre's bed, then slung a man under each middle one to ride there safely, shielding left and right, so sh three sheep could convey each man. I took the wooliest ram, the choice of the flock, and hung myself under its kinky belly, pulled up tight with fingers twisted deep in sheepskin, ringlets for an iron grip. So breathing harm, we waited until morning. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose, the rams began to stir, moving for pasture, and peals of bleeding echoed round the pens, where dams were with udders full called for milking. Blinded and sick with pain from his head wound, the master stroked each ram, then let it pass. But my men riding on the pectoral fleece, the giant's blind hands blundered never found. Last of them, all my ram, the leader, came, weighed out, weighed by wool, and me with my meditations. The cyclops patted him, then he said, Sweet cousin ram, why lag behind the rest in the night cave? You never linger so, but graze before them all, and go afar to crop sweet grass, and take your stately way, leading along the streams, until at evening you run to be the first one in the fold. Why now, so far behind? Can you be grieving over your master's eye? That carrion rogue and his accursed companions burnt it out when he had conquered all my wits with wine. Nobody will get out, will not get out alive, I swear. Oh, had you brain and voice to tell where he may be now? Dodging all my fury, bashed by his this hand and bashed on this rock wall. His brains would strew the floor, and I should have rest from the outrage. Nobody worked upon me. He sent us into the open then, close by. I dropped and rolled clear of the ram's belly, going this way and that to untie the men. With many glances back, we rounded up his fat, stiff-legged sheep to take aboard and drove them down to where the good ship lay. We saw, as we came near, our fellow faces shining. Then we saw them turn to grief, telling those who had not fled from death. I hushed them, jerking, jerking back and eyebrows up. And in a low voice told them, Woe this herd, move fast, and put the sheep's head toward the break breakers. They all pitched in at loading, and then embarked and struck their oars into the sea. Far out, as far offshore as shouted words would carry, I sent back f a few back to the adversary. Basically, the Cyclops has little sheep, and they tied themselves to the bottom of the sheep, and they use the sheep going out for herding, and they use that to escape 
from the Cyclops, who was blinded, and so they can never, he never noticed that the men were at the bottom of the sheep. Oh, Cyclops, would you feast on my companions? Punny am I, in a caveman's hands. How do you like the beating that we gave you, you damned cannibal, eater of guests under your roof? Zeus and the gods have paid you. The blind thing in his doubled fury broke a hilltop in his hands and heaved it after us. Ahead of our black prow, it struck and sank whelmed in a spuming geyser, a giant wave that washed the ship's stern foremost back in sh to shore. I got the longest boat hook, boat hook out and stood fending us off with fury snods to all to put their backs into a racing stroke. Row, row, or perish. So the long oars bent, kicking the foam sternward, making head until we drew away, and twice as far. Now when I cupped my hands, I heard the crew in low voices protesting. God's sake, Captain, why bait the beatest again? Let him alone. That tidal wave he made on the first throw all but beached us, all but stove us in. Give him our bearing with your trumpeting. He'll get the range and will lob a boulder. He'll smash our timbers and our heads together. I would not heed them in my glorying spirit, but let my anger flare and yell. Cyclops, if ever mortal man inquire how you were put to shame and blinded, tell them Odysseus, raider of cities, took your eye. Laerge, sons, whose home's on Ithaca. At this he gave a mighty sob and rumbled. Now comes the weird upon me, spoken of old. A wizard, grand and wondrous, lived there. Telemus, a son of Eurymus, great length of days he had in wizardry among the Cyclopses, and these things he foretold for time to come. My great eye lost, and at Odysseus's hands, I, always I had in mind some giant, armed in giant force, would come against me here. But this, you small, pitiful, and twiggy, you put me down with wine, you blinded me. Come back, Odysseus, and I'll treat you well, praying the god of earthquake to befriend you. His son I am, for he, by my ovoal, fathered me. And if he will, he may heal me of this black wound, he and no other of all happy gods or mortal men. So basically, Odysseus is bragging. He's like, ah, screw you, Polyphemus. I'm so much better than you. Tell your friends that I... Odysseus blinded you. And then basically Polyphemus is like, oh, okay, come back. Uh, my dad's Poseidon, by the way. So like you might wanna you might want to make him forgive you. Just just saying. Few words I shouted in reply to him. If I could take your life, I would and take your time away and hurl you down to hell. The god of earthquake could not heal you there. At this he stretched his hands out and in his darkness, toward the sky of stars, and prayed Odys Poseidon, Oh, hear me, Lord Blue Girdler of the Islands, if I am thine indeed, and thou art father, grant that Odysseus, Raider Cities, never see his home, Laertes' son, I mean, who kept his hall on Ethica, should destiny intend that he shall see his roof again among his family in his father's land, Far be that day, and dark the years between. Let him lose all companions, and return under strange sail to bitter days at home. In these words he prayed, and the god heard him. Now he laid hands upon a bigger stone, and wheeled around, titanic for the cast, to let it fly in the black proud vessel's track. But it fell short, just after, after the steering oar, and whelmed seas rose giant above the stone, to bear us onward toward the island. So basically, Odysseus... He gave out his identity and, like, basically told Polyphemus to screw off. And now Polyphemus uses his father to, like, curse Odysseus. And it's, like, stupid. Why would Odysseus do this? Odysseus is a big dummy. He gave himself up, really. Like, this entire thing was his fault. There, as we ran, and we saw the squadron waiting, the trim ships drawn up by, side by side, and all our troubled friends who waited, looking seaward. We beached her, grinding keel in the soft sand, and waded in, ourselves, on the sandy beach. Then we unloaded all the Cyclops' flock to make division, share and share alike. Only my fighters voted that my ram. The prize of all should go to me. I slew him to Zeus, beyond the storm cloud, Kronos' son, who rules the world. But Zeus disdained my offering. 
destruction for my ships he had in store, and death for those who sailed them, my companions. Now all day long, until the sun went out, we made our feast on mutton and sweet wine, till after sunset in the gathering dark. We went to sleep above the wash of ripples. When the young dawn, with her fingertips of rose, touched the world, I roused the men, gave orders to mans the ship, cast off the mooring lines, and filing in to sit beside the rowlocks, oarsmen, and line dipped oars in the gray sea. So we moved out, sad in the vast offing, having our precious lives, but not our friends. Summary, actually I have to do notes, so let's just write down the most important parts in our notes, everybody. Ugh. So, first thing that happens is Odysseus tells the tale of how he got banished told the tale of the 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 events before uh Odysseus describes how he and his men were were um like taken off course into foreign islands. Uh, the Lotus Eaters, um, tried to tempt, try to tempt them and make them stay on the island. But they refuse. Uh, next one is they end up on a Cyclops Island. Or on Polyphemus' Island. Um, uh, Polyphemus, they enter Polyphemus' cave. cave, and he eats some men. And the giant eats some men. Uh, the next one is that they create a giant stake and stab Polyphemus's eye. Um, while he is blinded, while the giant is blinded, so while the giant is uh, actually blinded, uh, they use his sheep to escape, hiding uh, attached to their bottoms while while they left for herding, while they. Left for herding. And then the next one is uh, Odysseus reveals his actual name. His true name. And 
Uh, Polyphemus. Uh, prays to his father to punish Odysseus. His father's Poseidon. Odysseus. Okay, that's those are the notes. Uh, let me also add in the note that uh, used uh, no. What was it? N H. I forgot what it was. Uh, N O H B D Y as a pun for nobody. To trick the other giants. into ignoring Polyphemus. Okay, that's, those are the notes. That's the summary. Um, they go around some islands. They reach Polyphemus' island. They go in his cave. Polyphemus eats a bunch of people. And so they devise a plan. They get a stake. They stab him in the eye. They blind him. And then they hide under his sheep while they go out for herding the next day. And they escape Polyphemus. And that's it. That's the end. That's the end. God, it's 912.